I come not only as a representative of the uh, Reformed Baptist churches back home in, in Zambia, and also what God is doing across Africa, but I also come as um, a, a witness to what TMAI is doing around the world, and you won't believe it, but as a witness on behalf of Russia, the institute there in Samara, where I happen to be in um, the middle of last year, I am a, a first-hand witness of what the Lord has done and continues to do in that place. It, it was remarkable as I mingled with the uh, brethren there, the faculty, the lecturers, and just sense something of their humility, the, the concern for biblical scholarship, the, the passion to, to ensure that this is communicated not only to those who are there at that time as students, but also right across um, that part of the world. So if uh, there is any unbiased witness, I'm not getting anything out of this, uh, I'm here to testify of something of that fruit. Well, very quickly, um, what I'm dealing with here is um, what is meant in Scripture by the phrase, in the name of Jesus. And that may sound to be a bit trifling because of the fact that, you know, what's in that little phrase? But then, um, I, I have some notes behind me, which I hope will guide us as we go uh, through. Um, it, it's, first of all, primarily because of the prevalent use of this phrase across uh, Africa among believers, but also I'm almost certain that as you are sitting here representing different parts of the world, that you also will probably identify with what I am speaking about in my session. And then if you can't, in the immediate sense, I'm hoping that you can at least apply the principles that I hope to share with here in whatever it is that is clearly a diversion from the content and meaning of um, the, the biblical teaching of the person and work of Christ. I'm hoping that we can apply it in that sense. Now, in the next statement I have there, I'd like you to... to uh, change the passage from Acts 2.38, it's actually meant to be Acts 3 and verse 6. So let me read it from the Bible here. Acts 3 and verse 6, this is what it says. I'll begin from verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, and this is the text, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Now, when you read that passage and you realize the way in which in the name of Jesus is, is being used, you would think that it represents what we are seeing here. In other words, a phrase that is, is being uh, popularly used 
as, as a means of unleashing power into a situation. And that's really what I would like to, to address. However, when you begin to see the way in which this is being done, thank you for laughing, <laughs> you begin to realize that, in fact, we are moving very far away from what Peter and John did in this passage of Scripture. Now, I received this less than a week ago. And someone was saying, if every, every tongue that speaks against you and your family shall catch fire, and there it is, in Jesus' name. <laughs> As if that's not bad enough. I received another one three days ago. And it says, whether the devil likes it or not, the Lord will prepare a place for us in the presence of our enemies. We shall eat that word is meant to be belly full and even use toothpick <laughs> in Jesus' name. <laughs> now, I didn't go to the internet to look for these things. This, this, th these are messages being sent to me in the last few days. And whoever the people are sending this, know that I'm a church pastor and they assume that this must be regular diet for believers. I shouldn't have a problem with this. Well, I do. <laughs> and the reason why I do so is because it, this is really African traditional religion and its belief system coming into the church through the back door. The, the chanting of phrases to enter into the spiritual realm, and I put that in quotation marks, is normal procedure in ATRs. Phrases are repeated to drive away spirits, evil spirits, and even to change the course of events. It's the kind of dancing that was taking place around the, the altar of Baal by the, the priests and prophets of Baal. And constantly chanting phrases in the hope that somehow, in the midst of all this, some spiritual effect or impact might occur. And sadly, in the name of Jesus, that phrase has fallen prey to the same world view. And Christians right across the continent are using this phrase in the name of Jesus to drive away evil spirits, to hold looming danger and any form of bad luck. In exactly the same way that other phrases in African traditional religions would be used. Now, my concern, what bothers me, is the lost content. The lost content. In other words, the phrase itself is a biblical phrase. You can't argue with it. We've just read from Acts 3, and Peter said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So clearly, the problem is not with the use of the phrase. But it's being used without any knowledge of the biblical content of that phrase. And I say here in the notes, most people will not be bothered by that, just as you in the West would not be bothered to try and find out the meaning of dabracadabra <laughs> when a magician is doing his, his activity. What you want to see is the magic. 
rather than to enter into what on earth that phrase means. And sadly, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a world, not just in the Western world, but back home, where what matters is, does it work? Is it somehow working? And yet, brethren, if we are truly biblical, we ought to realize that in the Christian faith, truth matters. It's not just what has apparently worked. It is, is the mind of God known, appreciated, and responded to here. That's our concern in evangelism. That's our concern in missions. That's our concern as we are training pastors. We don't just want them to know how to grow big churches. We want them to communicate truth. And through the communication of biblical truth, end up having living churches. The tragic loss in this particular case is that not only have we lost the content, but in the process we have lost the spiritual impact that that content ought to have upon people. Now let's face it. When you go to the scriptures, sometimes the use of the phrase in the name of Jesus does give the impression that it can be a phrase you just chant. And I have a few passages of scripture there that might give that impression. For instance, with respect to baptism, we have Acts 2, verse 38, and a few others which I will quote here for you. Acts 2, 38 says, Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And let's face it, when we are baptizing individuals, we use that phrase. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or, as some of you might say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. In the same way, with respect to Acts 8 and verse 16, we also have Acts 10, verse 48, and then also Acts 19 and verse 5. And again, we see it. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you can get that impression that perhaps that's the way the word or the phrase is to be used. We also have in Acts 16 verse 18 a commanding in the name of Jesus. You recall the Apostle Paul being annoyed when that slave girl that happened to have the powers of prediction and consequently making roaring business for her masters, was now saying that these are the servants of God. And the Bible tells us that Paul turned to the lady and said to the spirit that was in her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. So clearly, Paul used it as a phrase. And then we're familiar with Philippians chapter 2, that, uh, that wonderful piece of poetry that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, speaking about the pre-existent Christ, the humiliated Christ, and then finally the exalted Christ. And it is in the third section of that piece of poetry 
that the Apostle Paul says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Again, you, you, you imagine the situation, um, especially so in eternity, when a voice speaks the name of Jesus and the whole of the human race bows down to his lordship. So there's a way in which we may easily get that impression that that's what we're really dealing with, something of this phrase being used. However, it's not a chanting phrase. And an obvious example that I have given is the teaching in the name of Jesus. Teaching in the name of Jesus. I have a few verses there. First of all, Acts 4 verse 18. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Clearly, the Sanhedrin at this point we're not saying to the apostles, stop saying in Jesus' name. They must have been saying something greater than that. Or, as we read in chapter 4 of Acts and verse 40, they took his advice and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and consequently they released them. With respect to um, Barnabas and uh, Paul, we read in Acts 9 verse 27, but Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus, Paul had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. Same thing. It's not that Paul was going in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, as has become common fear these days. Paul was doing something much more than that. So, what does name mean here? What does name mean here? First of all, in this particular case, it clearly represents the person himself. So it's not a little phrase to be parroted, and then we are seeing some kind of effect with respect to that. But when we're speaking about in the name of Jesus, we have in mind the, the totality of the person of Jesus himself. So when individuals who do not know Jesus in the spiritual sense think that they can just parrot that phrase and consequently achieve something, they are in fact misusing the Lord's name. They are guilty of breaking God's clear commandments. It represents everything about that name. You remember referring to his birth, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. In other words, we're thinking about a person who is a savior. He's a savior. You cannot do anything in the name of Jesus if you are ignorant of who he is and what he has done in the work of salvation. You can't do that. Leon Morris puts it this way. 
speaking about the, the passage where two or three are gathered in my name, he says, two or three once again brings before the reader the smallest possible group. The apparently insignificant matter to God. Now here's our area of interest. In my name may mean calling on my name or with me as their reason for assembling. With me as their reason for assembling. In other words, they are gathering together with me in mind. May I add, my honor and my glory. Because in that context, it has primarily to do with church discipline. And we are there primarily because his honor is at stake. The name will stand for the person. It is not simply pronouncing the name of Jesus, but in order to worship Jesus, to be with Jesus or the like. So let's be very clear about that. And I want to repeat, it's the loss of the content that bothers me. The loss of the content. Who is Jesus? What is this content that has been lost? Well, if you're to bring together the totality of uh, inscripturated revelation, here is the answer. First of all, with respect to his person. He is the second person in the Trinity. He is God the Son who created all things and then took on himself human flesh in order to be our Savior. That's the content with respect to the person himself. With respect to what it is he has done, we go on to see that through his active and passive obedience, Jesus came to save his elect people from sin and hell so that we may joyfully worship and live for the glory of God here on earth and in heaven. I'm using the phrase active and passive purely as normally taught historically in, um, the, in theology. But ultimately the point that is being made is this. We heard a few moments ago, it is finished. It is that information that should, as it were, color our thinking when we are speaking of in the name of Jesus. The great God, creator of the entire universe, who steps into history in order to rescue us from sin, who suffers from birth, to death, from the cradle to the cross, and to the question why, as we've already heard, it is as our substitute. We owe God a debt we cannot pay. Christ comes and fully discharges that debt on our behalf. And he does it in such a way that God is fully satisfied, 100%. I don't need to repeat the message that we have just heard, but that was solid, solid stuff. <laughs> That's the content. That's the content. And when we then move into the context of prayer, therefore, you begin to see its application. That whatever we ask in my name must be processed through that sieve. In other words, 
is not simply a blank check that's been given to us so that we can do and get anything we want through a phrase in Jesus' name. If there were ever dangerous passages of Scripture, John 14 is one of them. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. Well, it doesn't end there. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In other words, there's already something that God is engaged in. The work of redemption. And Jesus is the Redeemer. And the work of redemption is for his own glory. And therefore, we are but means by which that fabric of redemption is moving towards its ultimate destiny, its glorious destiny, the glory of God. And when God, by his Spirit, has opened our eyes to the, the glory of his Son and the great issues of his kingdom, well, that preoccupies our prayers. As Jesus himself taught us to pray, our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name, may your name be glorified. Your kingdom come, may your rule spread. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May you be obeyed. Now, as we pray concerning all that, and we are now praying in terms of details, the, the, the issues that are there now, he answers, and God is glorified. The point is, that should inform our minds. It's that world that should be behind the phrase, praying in the name of Jesus. And as you note, it's not so much authority there. I'm not going before God and... In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. This is what we want from you in Jesus' name. No. It's not about the fact that I've received some kind of power by which I can twist God's arm until he says, okay, 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 get it. <laughs> and, and you even feel like that when you sit in some prayer meetings back home. But rather... It's going to him humbly in the merits of his own son. That's what you're doing. Again, it's informing you as you are going before the Lord. Or to borrow the words of Count Zizendorf, referring ultimately to eternity, Jesus Thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my most glorious dress. Midst flaming worlds, in these arrayed with joy, I will lift up my head. That's really the world behind it. And consequently, you can look forward to entry into eternity without any tremor passing through your being. Because of what? In the name of Jesus. Or, as uh, Jerry Bridges puts it, with respect to prayer, he says, as I kneel before God, I say, Father, I come today through your infinite grace and through the infinite righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I base all my requests on his righteousness. On his righteousness. 
goes on to say, as someone has said, Jesus Christ has bought and paid for on the cross the answer to every prayer that we will ever petition. And so to come in his name means to come in his merit, in his righteousness. Blessed soul he was as he taught among us, wasn't it? So what does the name of Jesus mean? I want to use what I've just spoken about as a, a test by going to these few passages and then asking whether they do fit into what we are reading there. We are told that before Paul was converted, it's he himself saying it, he opposed the name of Jesus. Now again, Paul did not oppose a phrase. He opposed all that was associated with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that makes sense. Later, Paul was willing to die for the name of Jesus. Again, he was not willing to die for a little phrase that I'm going to keep saying it even if you threaten to chop off my head. He was willing to die for all that was associated with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the name of Jesus being glorified would be the same thing. I uh, have a few more there, and I won't spend too much time, but I am hoping you are beginning to see the content in that phrase. The content in that phrase. Assembled in Jesus' name, sanctified and justified, in the name of Jesus, that's 1 Corinthians 6, doing everything in Jesus' name. And then finally, back to our text, and it's meant to be Acts 3, verse 6 there, and not Acts 2, 38. Having proved it by going back to the texts of the Bible, let's now see this. Every tongue that speaks against you and your family shall catch fire in Jesus' name. In, in everything associated to his person and his work, it doesn't square. <laughs> or this, which is even worse. Whether the devil likes it or not, the Lord will prepare a place for us in the presence of our enemies. We shall eat belly full and even use toothpick in Jesus' name. <laughs> now the fact that Believers are sending this to a Reformed Baptist pastor. <laughs> it's worrying. <laughs> Clearly, there is gross ignorance. And that's the issue that we really need to deal with. Let me hurry on then to a few practical implications. And let's just have really four of them. I'll walk you through them. First of all, we need to ensure that we are teaching a full-orbed Christology in our pastors, to our pastor students. We mustn't be in too much of a hurry so that subjects related to doctrine, systematic theology, and to be more precise, Christology is something we're just sort of rushing through so that we get guys off the, 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 the meal on graduation day and off they go. Because when we do that, we are going to allow real ignorance 
to go into the churches. Which brings me to the second point. We need to urge our pastors to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ in their pulpits. It must be the heartbeat of the Christian faith that must fill the ministrations that take place in our pulpits regularly. So that God's people have the content of Christ, the content of the person and work of Christ in their beings. And hopefully when they get out there, they are going to see the, the disconnect between those phrases and what the Bible really says. Which brings me to the third. We need to draw the attention of our people to the way culture easily leads to syncretism. It easily does. Because of the way in our culture we use phrases before we know it, it's worked its way into the Christian church, and that's the way we're using Jesus' name. And it's crucial that we let our people realize that what they are now doing is exactly what was being done and continues to be done in, in our case in African traditional religions. And then lastly, we need to toil and labor for discernment in today's Christianity. Its absence is worry. Getting Christians to think, not just get carried away with things, but to think, and to think biblically. Are you sure that's what the phrase in the name of Jesus means in the Bible? Are you sure? Think. Here's my conclusion. Quoting Charles Wesley. And there's no doubt that when Charles wrote these words, he had that biblical landscape that we just talked about, the person and work of Christ before his view. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that beads our sorrow seas, tis music in the sinner's ear, tis life and health, and peace. It's because of the atoning work of Christ. It's not just a name that you repeat and somehow fear dissipates or disappears. It's the world behind it. And then, I hope every preacher here will identify themselves with that cry of Charles Wesley. My gracious master and my God, assist me to proclaim to spread through all the earth abroad the owners of thy name. In other words, the person and glorious work of Christ, oh, that I might preach it to my dying day. Amen.